Well, hey, today we are starting a new sermon series through the letter that has been given to the church from James. And as we begin this new sermon series that we're going to walk through over the next nine or so weeks, I just want to give a brief introduction to this wonderful letter. And I want to point out who this James is that we're going to be reading from, because the New Testament actually mentions a number of different people that are named James. And internal and external evidence would help us understand that this letter was written by James, not the apostle that we are first introduced to in the Gospels, but this is James, the half-brother of Jesus, who is a different person. This is the James that was once an unbeliever with other members of his family and was converted after Jesus appeared to him following his resurrection. This author, James, assumed leadership of the church at Jerusalem, probably sometime around 45 A.D., just after the apostle Peter was imprisoned. We read about that early on in the book of Acts. And we see this leadership from James demonstrated, demonstrated as he addresses the Gentile controversy at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. Most historians date the Jerusalem Council somewhere around the time frame of 49 AD. Now, I'm not just throwing out dates just to give them. I think they're important for all of us as we approach this letter because, uh, because of the content of what we're going to find here about what is addressed in this letter and then what is not addressed in this letter. And it, because of that, that, help, that points to and helps us to see that this was written somewhere in the time range between 45 and 49 A.D. So somewhere around 15 years or so after the resurrection of Christ is when this began to be distributed. Now this lets us know that this is most likely the earliest of all of the New Testament writings. So here's what we can know and what we can expect over the next nine weeks or so. This letter was written to the dispersed Jewish church. Now, if this was before the council that happened in Jerusalem that brought together the leaders of the church to discuss this whole Gentile controversy, then we can understand why James would only write it to this Jewish church that had been dispersed after the persecution. This was a letter that was written to very much an, a church that was in an infant and a developing stage. This was written and distributed some five to seven years before the Apostle Paul's first letter that he wrote to the churches that we have in the New Testament canon. And it's probably 10 to 12, was written 10 to 12 years before Paul's letter to the Romans. Most would even place the writing of this letter before the Gospel of Mark. Now, that doesn't mean that James didn't have complete knowledge of what Mark then communicated to the church, but we see that James is writing, though, most likely before this. Now, the implications of this are that James does not address the doctrinal themes and the practices of the church that we find in writings of someone like Paul or Peter. Even some of the themes that are covered in the Gospels are not found in James's letter. The book of James would actually resemble more closely the book of Proverbs than it would one of Peter's or Paul's letters. If we were to write a letter in a style that James wrote a letter, we would probably do it in some kind of form like a bullet point letter. Say, here are the things that, that I want to communicate to you that are, that are important to me. That doesn't mean that they're not connected. And we're going to see that, that even though we, it is in that style, we're going to see how it's connected. Here's what James does do very clearly. 
as he's primarily addressing the ethical and the disappointing issues in the life of this early developing infant church, he writes with a unique level of intensity. The scattered church at this point in time, 15 years after the resurrection of Christ, very early on in its life is at a very vulnerable place. And he was convinced that he had to emphasize, according to God's providence, that the living and vibrant fruit is a necessary result of true, authentic faith. And this faith, that if authentic, will reveal the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that all throughout the letter. So that's a little introduction to where we're going, who this was. Now I'm going to read James chapter 1. I'm going to let you, I'm going to invite you to remain seated while I read this passage. James 1, 1 through 8. If you're looking for this, this is tucked away at the end of the New Testament, just after the book of Hebrews, just before Peter's letters. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously, to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we just ask now for the Blessing on your word that has just been read, hopefully received by your people and by the power of your spirit that you would store it in our hearts, allow for us to live it out in our lives. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. So this theme will carry today's sermon, but also it will carry us through the rest of this series that we must have a faith that reveals the God that we believe in. So this is kind of our main idea. And so we're going to kind of take, take a little journey through these first eight verses. And especially starting in verse 2, we're going to see how James starts out his letters, letter by saying, count it all joy. And so I just want to bring up the question, is, is he really telling us to have joy in trials? A number of years ago, this was at my former church, we had a deadbolt on the door of, uh, of the church building. And so every morning when I got there, I pulled out my church key and opened the, opened the church door. And I noticed over time, I somewhat ignored it, but my key started getting, it was more and more difficult to um, get it to unlock and to pull the key out. But I could always get it out. And so this one particular day, I put my key in to unlock the church door, and I couldn't get it to unlock, and then I couldn't get the key to, to get out, but I, to pull out of the lock, but I had to get into the, to the church. And I don't recall if I had a meeting or just something pressing that I needed to get in there for, but it was a fairly urgent situation. And so I'm really just messing with this key, doing everything I can. And, and finally, I'm kind of leaning up against the door, and I'm really pressing in to try to turn the key. At that point, I didn't care whether I got the key out of the lock. I just wanted to get in the door. And so I'm doing that, and I'm really cranking on this key. And I broke the key off in the lock. It just snapped right off into the deadbolt. About that time, my great friend, also who was the office manager at the church, her name is Stacy, often known for applying scripture verses to real life situations, saw my frustration and said, Jake, I want you to consider it joy that this happened. 
Now, some would argue that there is never an inopportune time to quote Scripture. But at this moment in time, I did not want to hear that I need to be joyful about what was going on. Because not only had I lost my key, I could not get in to the door of the church at that point. Now, I don't look back at that time, even though whatever I was experiencing then was frustrating. I don't look back at that time and consider that a true trial. But if it is too hard for me to consider that joy, what does it mean when serious life-altering events happen? It may sound good. It may look good on paper, especially when we're not experiencing something difficult. But I don't think I'm taking too much of a risk to say that it is universally challenging, maybe impossible, to consider our trials joyful. And we may even claim this verse in the midst of some type of suffering. And I've, I've done that. I've seen that happen in many situations. But if things don't turn around fairly quickly, we lose that sentiment, don't we? The quoting of this Bible verse gets dimmer and dimmer as our trials get more difficult and harder to bear. Now, I appreciate the way that James opens his letter to the church. I consider it a sacred part of Scripture. But I don't know that I want James telling me this in the midst of my suffering. When I think of joy, I think of wholeness, not brokenness. My joyful moments, as I look back, and when I think ahead, or when something has been gained, not lost. What about you when you tie joy to experience? What about you when you connect joy with your future? What are things that come to mind? Is it gain? Is it loss? Now why am I picking on myself? Why am I picking on all of us here? And the reason is, is because I want us to see that James is telling us to do something here, starting the whole letter off on this. He's telling us to do something here that doesn't work according to our fallen nature. And now that we can give that some attention, now that we can recognize that, I think we can begin to discover what stands in the way of us and then considering it joy when we face various trials. So why is this such a problem? So I want, I want to lead to the, from this question to our secular assumption. This is really our second point. And our assumptions are that this is all that there is. This world, all that we see, all that's around us, this is what we have. This is what there is. And trials, sufferings, loss, setbacks, change, whatever, however you want to describe it, they keep us from living this life to its fullest or to its highest level of comfort or to the security that we long for. Or sufferings, loss, setbacks, they cause us not to experience maybe the passionate life that we so want. And this type of living, when we look at our world in this way, and when we assume that our future is dependent on everything falling into place as we have planned, this is informed by a secular worldview. If we believe that this is all that there is, and we have this life to fulfill our dreams and leave our mark, then there's no way to consider it joy when we face trials of various kinds. Because when unexpected difficulties come and detour us, then we're missing out on what could be or what we think they should be. Trials bring, bring disappointment, opposite of joy. Now, even if you are a believer in Christ, in eternal life, our idea of life after death is so often so far removed from life here that we have adopted this secular assumption. 
even if we're in Christ, even if we have this solid belief in something after death, we've removed ourselves so much from that that we've adopted this. Even we still live by the mantra, life is short, or you only live once, meaning we've got to get it all in, or we can't lose what we have, or we have to take this opportunity because this may be our last chance to make this happen. Does any of that sound familiar? Does a season of your life, or even currently, does it de depict those sentiments? Life is short. You only live once. Does that sound familiar? Am I the only Christian that goes through that? If our assumptions keep us from this directive that James has given us, consider it joy when you face trials of many kinds, then we need a corrective. If we have adopted this secular assumption that we're surrounded with, it tells us, go for it. You only have this life. Then we need a corrective, and thankfully, we're offered one. And so I want us to see this, a supernatural correction here. James says, for you know that the testing of our faith, and we're going to get back to this in a moment because we're going to go a little further with this idea, but I want us to see that James, when he's bringing up faith here, which he goes back to over and over again in his letter, he is moving us away from this sec secular assumption. So James is writing or, or telling somebody who is writing for him, and he's understanding, okay, I'm telling them, consider it all joy. These people have been removed from their homes. They're struggling to stay afloat. We can tell that James is writing to a lot of people that are in, in poverty or on the verge of poverty. And so he understands that they're thinking about their life. And they've just, and they're reading or hearing James say this. And he knows what's in the background of their assumptions. It's a very similar assumption that we have today. And so he begins to move away from that secular assumption, trying to hold on to everything because of this life only. And he moves them into another realm of something more, something unseen, something that I believe James along with other biblical authors, are attempting to ready us for the kingdom that is already here, but not yet what it will be. Reminding the readers of that. Something that James himself is experiencing, this kingdom of God that, of whom Christ reigns over that's here. Not yet what it one day will be. So here's our supernatural, our biblical corrective, and this is a distinctive of the Reformed faith that should get more attention. Because of our covenant with God in Christ, we are being renewed day by day. This is, we're told this in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, 17. Because of our covenant of God, covenant with God in Christ, we are being renewed day by day. Romans 8 tells us that the world, creation, awaits its own redemption just as we await the redemption of our bodies. And so Paul, in writing to two different churches, he's talking about this biblical corrective of un understanding this renewal that's taking place and connecting that with the renewal that God is bringing forth that will renew the whole world and renew us even to the point of the redemption of our bodies. So there will be a day of renewal and redemption. 1 Corinthians 3 and 2 Peter 3, if you just wanted to jot those down, they, they describe that this is going to happen with fire. Both that we're going to be a part of and the whole earth and the heavens is going to be a part of this 
this fire or this purifying, revealing agent that is promised. And thus it will be new because of that, but there will be far more continuity by God's providence than maybe what we have from medieval images that depict the next life. Or maybe what our mind's eye has created for us about what our future after death holds for us. So what this means for us is that, yes, what we do here greatly matters. But not because we only get one crack at it. So here, this is the main way this is corrected. What we do here greatly matters. And there's something about this life that there is an urgency to it. But it's not because we, this is it. It's because of what we are taking part in now will carry over into eternity for God's people. Now, when I've done the stacking blocks with my children, and, and all, all three of them, the fourth is soon to get there. But my oldest three, their, their whole approach is take the blocks, get them as tall as we can, as fast as possible. One black block on top of another. Sometimes they fit, own the other or not. And so I've tried to show them, each child, with patience and grace, hey, I understand that you want a tall building, but if we can spend a little more time making the base wider and then build from there, we can actually eventually go taller. It'll take more time and more care and we may have to see that we've done a couple of things wrong and then, and then replace some. But look at what can happen if we take more time. Now, I think that could be a way to understand how God is using this life. Using this life as a way of molding us, shaping us, crafting us. Sometimes that's painful. He's doing things that we don't necessarily see or want. He's pulling us in directions that we would not like to go in, but he's doing this to make us into who we will be becoming for all of eternity. This is happening now. In these moments, we will recognize one another in our redemption in eternity as we see each other right now. This is you. This is how God is crafting you for a, an eternity of being completed in Him. Dr. Dallas Willard was an influential ph philosopher, and he was a professor at the University of Southern California, forget this, 48 years. As a committed Christian, he wrote and lectured a great deal about Christian spiritual formation. And amazingly, he crossed boundaries within the academy probably more than anybody in our lifetime. He passed away probably three or four years ago. When he, when he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, this was in the late summer of 2012, one of his reflections was this. I think that, quote, I think that when I die, it might be some time until I know it. Now here's why I think that is such a special state. It's alarming, isn't it? But here's why I think that's such a special statement. Because for him to say, I think that when I die it will be sometime before I know it, he is not saying that things aren't going to be different. Of course, we, we're told very clearly that things will be glorious and different. But our He's saying our new life actually begins with our new birth here. That when we have died to our old self, when we are putting faith not in ourself but in Christ, there is a true resurrection that happens. We begin living in the kingdom of Christ, this eternal kingdom, under the reign of Christ as He reigns right now, even as we await the glorious day of His return. There's a continuity to it. 
And so I think that's such a special observation that Dr. Willard is able to make, alarming as it is, and as different as we have probably ever heard anyone talk about as a, a Christian speak about life after his time here. The kingdom that is already here, that is not yet what it will be. So we're going to very quickly walk through these last couple of things because James wants to get into this idea of wisdom. Now, we read this passage in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Now, this may not be the most recognizable, famous, most quoted verse in all of Scripture, but how many of you has it in your top ten most recognizable verses? Anybody? I mean, there's going to be a good portion. But here's what may be new. This is this idea of if any of you lacks wisdom, then ask God. This gospel benefit of wisdom that becomes because of our union with Christ, it comes on the heels of suffering. James is connecting this on the heels of when various trials come. It's actually to verify, is to solidify your faith, which produces steadfastness, which leads to completeness. But James clarifies this in verse 5 to make it very clear. Hey, this is, this is why you can have joy in trials, because it leads to this, but it's not automatic. So when suffering comes, it's not automatic that it's going to lead to this completeness. As you probably know, trials have often led people to bitterness, to even walking away from the faith, to despair. And he's saying, for this to work, you need wisdom. Wisdom that comes from God, a wisdom that is a result of trials and sufferings, loss, painful change. And this wisdom is for the sake of gaining completeness in Christ. And so James is drawing this, this path for us from trials to completeness. And wisdom, and this isn't a straight line. This is doing this, you know, sometimes going backwards. But he's drawing this line, this path. And wisdom is there. It's such a part of this process. And it leads to, this, this whole path leads to our joy that comes from, in, from being complete. And so this, this path from trials to completeness, this is, this is how James is describing joy. And so back to the testing of your faith that produces steadfastness. Another way to understand this idea of the testing of your faith is to see that James is saying that trials actually put your faith on trial. So before a jury and a, and a judge, if, if you will. And it determines the trustworthiness of your faith. And so I think we can anticipate something here. That when we experience hardship, setbacks, sickness, extreme loss that leaves us wanting and hurting. This is to know that this is when our faith goes on trial. Not necessarily for us to prove our faith to the Lord, but for us to prove our faith to ourselves. That our faith would be proved as trustworthy so that we would grow in our steadfastness, which would lead to our completeness that God is doing for us in Christ. And this happens as it is authenticated and it reveals our belief in the one who was put on trial. The one who, when he was put on trial, he was then sentenced to death, dying for our sake. The one who then walked out of the tomb, and as he walks out of the tomb, we see that he walks out in glory, perfect and complete, and now forever lives, committed to making us perfect 
and complete. Now, are you struggling to find joy in the trials that you face? Or do you look back over your life and do you see that trials have typically not produced joy? Oftentimes there's been joy after the fact when you've been able to look back and see what God has done. But James is actually calling us to put to put to have joy as the trials come because what that means is, is that steadfastness is coming. Because by them, one day, you will lack nothing. This is God's plan, His providence. That's something for us as part of His people to rejoice over. God is working in our life, lives as we are hurting and as we are losing things. He is providing for us something greater than we can ever imagine. There is great joy in that. We close our time in prayer. Father, as you help us recognize the great difficulty, maybe the impossibility of coming to this conclusion on our own, I pray that as you help us to dig deep into what it means to have joy in the midst of suffering. To consider our trials something of a blessing. Lord, give us the wisdom that comes with our union in Christ. Help us to see what awaits us. And Father, give us the strength and the discernment and the power to live within this life as you are preparing for us for something so glorious, a new heavens and a new earth that you are in the you are right now redeeming for us. We thank you for bringing us into your great kingdom, this kingdom that we are already in that we're already experiencing your benefits. Reveal those things to us, O oh God. Thank you for the power that comes with the gospel. May we not be ashamed of it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.